So to set the scene for conference, I'm going to invite onto the stage Sharon Hill. Sharon is the director of the Museums Association and the driving force behind the energy and momentum that the MA has galvanized over the last few years. Sharon is very concerned to ensure that as museums professionals, we of course manage our resources, manage our people, manage our collections and manage our audiences. But she wants also to ensure that we look up, look out and look at where the museum sector is and should be in the world. Please welcome Sharon. Thank you, Hilary. <clears throat> so I am sandwiched this morning between the wonderful Hilary Carty, our amazing theme coordinators, and the superhero that is Lem Sisse. So I've got a difficult task, and also I'm from Leeds, not Manchester. <laughs> it's a year since we had our last annual conference in Glasgow, and what a year it has been. In fact, it's been quite a wild and unpredictable 24 months. So I want to look at what's happening outside our small sector, outside of museums, and examine the troubled times that we live in and how museums are responding. In June of last year, we had the EU referendum, which I think we can all acknowledge marked a sea change for our communities, for the people that we live and work with, for our relationship with Europe and the rest of the world, and has had ramifications for every single part of the UK, and in particular, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Apparently, he wants his country back, but after the meltdown in Westminster that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, I think we should be campaigning for our democracy back. I don't think there'll be many women who are surprised by the revelations that have come out of Westminster and other governments, but really we should be shocked that discrimination and abuse is so widespread and entrenched in our political systems. We know that after the referendum, there was a spike in hate crime in the UK. There was a spike in racist attacks and Islamophobia, not helped by front pages and headlines such as this one. Incidents of hate crime ha are on the increase and have gone up a third in the UK since the referendum. The figures that were released by the Home Office confirm victims' report of a dramatic increase in hostility and attacks towards them in, uh, because of their race, nationality and religion. We also witnessed in this city the horrific terrorist attack and terrorist attacks in London as well. I think they point to further divides in society and in our communities. We know that food poverty affects four million people in the UK. According to the people who administer the benefit, it is pushing people into poverty. There was an interview with a whistleblower who's a benefit administrator in The Independent recently, and he talked about turning people away who are in abject <coughs> poverty. He said that's become an everyday part of his job, and he sees suffering on a daily basis. He said, we often have to tell claimants that the state cannot support them anymore even if they have weeks until the next payment and they have young children to feed. Social isolation in the UK is rife. According to research, 40% of older people say that the television is their main source of company. I just think that's an absolutely heartbreaking statistic. But we're not isolated from the impacts of climate change. There were headlines on the news about climate change this morning. And it's not just something that causes upset or displacement or inconvenience. Last month, a report was published by the UN Climate Change Organization and published 
in The Lancet, which outlined how climate change is impacting the health and welfare of millions of people across the world. It's contributing to the spread of, and the sources of infectious diseases and also the increase in malnutrition and hunger. The refugee crisis continues apace and is set to get much worse. A report from the Environmental Justice Foundation has predicted that tens of millions of people will be forced from their homes over the next decade. You don't have to take their word for it. The former US military general Stephen Cheney said, if Europe think they have a problem with migration today, wait 20 years. See what happens when climate change drives people out of Africa. And we're talking now not just of 2 million, but 10 or 20 million people. And they are not going to South Africa, they are going across the, Mod the Mediterranean. A consequence of the refugee crisis will be more people forced into modern slavery. A government commissioned report published in October of this year found a 300% increase in the number of victims of modern slavery. So what will our global leaders' response to these events be? Will it be more denial, more walls, more borders, more bans? Let's look how Trump responded to the events in Charlottesville. And let's remember that his election was greeted enthusiastically by the Ku Klux Klan. After Charlottesville, he condemned the hatred and bigotry and violence on many sides, on many sides. So we have a president of the United States that can't tell the difference between an anti-Nazi and a neo-Nazi. One incident that <clears throat> really brought it home to me was the awful tragedy at Grenfell Tower. I think it exposed the housing poverty in one of the richest countries in the world. This image is the pinned tweet of Khadija Say, who worked at Lan London Transport Museum. She's an artist and a photographer, a museum detox activist and a campaigner. She's speaking here at the opening of the Venice Biennale Diaspora Pavilion. She said on the tweet, it's been a real journey, but mama, I'm an artist exhibiting in Venice and the blessings are abundant and she was a victim of Grenfell Tower. So I have two questions for conference, and they are how do we remember people like Khadija, and how do we respond? How do museums respond to these contemporary events? Because the artists are responding. This is Jeremy Della's intervention during the general election this year, and he'll be speaking at conference later over the course of the next two days. And the poets are responding. I'm sure many people will remember the poet Tony Walsh standing on the steps of Manchester Town Hall after the terrorist attack. And his words really resonated with me. So excuse the accent, because it's Leeds, not Manchester. But he said, and we make you at home, and we make you feel welcome. And we make some that happen, and we can't seem to help it. But if you're looking for history, then yeah, with a wealth. But the Manchester way is to make it yourself. And I thought, when he said that, that's what great museums do. They enable people to explore their history, to create their own stories. They help us understand the past and the present, and they can help us shape the future. So the athletes are responding to contemporary events, campaigning for equality, and justice. The filmmakers are responding and exposing the reality of life for some people living in 21st century Britain. And even the craft workers are responding. But it's not just the artists and the poets and the filmmakers that are stepping out of the comfort zone and making us think. Museums are addressing a host of contemporary events and fostering reflection, debate, and critical thinking. After Grenfell Tower, the Museum of Homelessness, 
wrote a blog entitled Enough is Enough. And in that blog, they said the devastating tragedy at Grenfell Tower was one which could have been avoided. Our thoughts are with those affected and we will do what we can to help in the aftermath. We're aware through our research and that of our partners that ordinary people have been cleansed out of social housing in London, often being moved to appalling accommodation. Now, in Kensington and Chelsea, through negligence, people have lost their lives in housing that was meant to transform them. And it's not just museums like the Museum of Homelessness that are responding. National Museum Wales has worked with the homelessness charity, The Wallach, and created a brand new exhibition called Who Decides, co-curated with that community in the main galleries of the National Museum in Cardiff. The International Museum of Slavery responds not just to Liverpool's links with transatlantic slavery, but also to modern slavery and its impact on communities now. The response can take many forms. This image is from the Sex Avengers, a group that reclaimed LGBTQ heritage sites in London by putting the blue plaques on them. And they said, in their words, we want to create a living museum of queer history. How fantastic that a group of activists and campaigners want to create a living museum. We know that you, museum workers, are responding to the inequality and the challenges in society. There have been contingents of museum workers on Pride in London, in Cardiff, in Liverpool and other cities, emphasising the fact that museums are for everyone and can tell diverse stories. We can use our collections to do amazing things. This image is from an exhibition in Glasgow, the world's first museum display around the work of Alcoholics Anonymous. Martin, a member of the AA in Scotland, said, the AA does incredible work in every community. As a member, I'm honoured to have helped to put this exhibition together. I hope anyone who sees it and feels they could benefit will come along to a meeting, will take that first often daunting step I'm eternally grateful that I did, and I'm delighted to see the display open in such a prestigious building as Kelvin Grove. We know over the course of this conference we'll hear from Francesca Martinez, who took part in Exceptional and Extraordinary, examining the way that society views difference using the collections of medical museums. Many of you will be familiar with the work of Museum Detox, which not only brings together people from BME backgrounds, but also campaigns for representation in the workforce and audiences. Many, many museums work with refugees. This is images from the Horniman Museum in South East London, which has been working with refugees and asylum seekers and new communities for many years. And some museums are also challenging us to think about attitudes to refugees and immigration. Tyne and Weir Museum put up this exhibition this year called If You Lived Here, supporting debate and discussion and reflection. There are very few civic spaces left that can do that. This is another exhibition from the Discovery Museum, I think, in Tyne and Weir, on International Women's Day, getting communities and audiences engaged in the debate, inviting views and discussions, and valuing and supporting those opinions. How pertinent it is to think about that in the light of the events in Westminster and beyond. Empowering women is close to the heart of Glasgow Women's Library the only public collection of women's history in the UK. I know many, women, many museums will be celebrating the centenary of some women getting the vote next year and playing host to discussion and debate about equality and gender and diversity. There are lots of museums doing groundbreaking work 
from Liverpool to Cardiff to Barnsley and across the UK to combat social isolation to improve health and well-being. In conclusion, we know that many, many museums of all scale and type are doing this kind of work, but we know there is more to be done. And that's where Museums Change Lives comes in. Museums Change Lives, as I hope you're all familiar, is our campaign to increase and support socially engaged practice in museums, to enhance health and well-being working with our communities, to create better places for us all to live and work, and to inspire engagement, debate and reflection. Working together, we can do this. Thank you.